everyone. Today we're going to take a little bit of a departure from our normal Let's Learn Food Science topics and I'm going to summarize a lecture that I gave for Food Processing Skills Canada on May 24th, 2019, where I was asked to speak on the future of the food industry in Canada in particular, but I think some of these trends are quite relevant to anywhere within the global audience. And so I put up my favorite cheese photo. My daughter thinks I'm the cheesiest person around and I will not disagree. Anyways, it's so fun to be invited to come and speak about trend analysis. And it's so easy to just fall into, let's talk about plant proteins. Let's talk about um, climate change and environmentalism. Let's talk about corporate social responsibility. All those trends have been really well documented. What I really wanted to dig into was thinking about forecasting relative to human resources because this is Food Processing Skills Canada in particular and thinking about what are the skills going to be necessary to succeed as organizations and succeed as individuals moving forward into into the next 10 years. So Canada, let's think a little bit about the demographic trends and how that's going to impact on the workforce. But uh, Canada's population is going to increase uh, slowly but surely over the next period of time. Now the stats that are given here from StatsCan are relative to 2050, which is not a 10 year forecast, but we're seeing we're seeing continual growth and economic growth is going to be coupled with that. How are we seeing this population growth? Well, we're seeing a huge shift towards an older population and we're not seeing that same growth in the number of children that are being added our growth in Canada comes from immigration and that's a great thing from an innovation perspective because it means that we're bringing the best and the brightest people from around the world, people who are really enthusiastic about contributing back to society and that from an innovation standpoint bodes really well. Now again we are going to be in a bit of an inverted market or labor market because we're going to see more older adults, then we are going to see young adults entering the workforce. And again, where are we going to find growth in employment? It's going to be through immigration. Again, another statistic here, much of Canada is going to be in that inverted population model where you see more older adults and fewer young people, except that we're going to see a younger population growing in um, the Prairie Provinces, and in northern Canada in particular. And that growth of the northern Canadian population and in particular the growth of First Nations, um, First Nations, Inuit, Métis populations, that is going to be a unique opportunity for, for growth of food manufacturing businesses in Canada. Again, more stats, lots of stats here. Who's declining? The boomer population is declining. And that is going to be a major loss in many manufacturing sectors because these uh, early Gen Xers and boomers who are bit by bit uh, leaving the workforce have a very broad wealth of knowledge. And we need to see that level of knowledge transfer occurring. We'll talk a little bit more about skills development and how we also need to see reskilling of some of the populations that are already within the workforce, the Gen X and millennial workforce that's already in place. Gen X is going to be taking over the leadership of companies uh, more or less starting now. Now, in many of our manufacturing sectors, we are seeing flatline growth of employment. Back in the province of Ontario, there were some targets of increasing uh, in, uh, net employment and those numbers for us uh, to a, a greater extent were not exactly realized the way they were intended. We're however seeing growth of net sales of manufactured goods and we're seeing an increase of 
food products as contribution to gross domestic product as a whole. So why are we seeing flatline employment but increased value in sales? Part of it's just inflation and the value of the commodities going into those food products is increasing. But part of it is productivity improvements. We are going to be seeing more and more productivity increases within companies across Canada to be able to compete within the global marketplace. Now, in some sectors, we are seeing slight increases, but in other sectors, we're seeing clear declines. And we can link some of those declines directly to changing food trends. Sugar and confectionery, not a big surprise that we're seeing declines in sugar and confectionery because as a whole, our population is very concerned about the health impacts of sugar on the diet and eating too much candy and too many uh, sweet foods and the negative potentials on health. However, we're also seeing, uh, if not flatline, gro actual growth in net sales in this category. So again, ask that question, is this growth due to commodity pricing or is it due to actual net growth of production? And therefore, are we seeing this as on the backs of increased productivity in the industry? Well, when we think of productivity increases in the industry, Yes, we are seeing consolidation into larger manufacturing facilities where we're seeing more automation, more routine tasks being taken away from individuals and uh, being mechanized. This is going to be part of the picture that we build into our trend forecast. But what we also see is a real interest culturally in food as an employment opportunity, food as culture, food as life. And that has its own resurgence. We're seeing this wonderful dynamic of people recapturing their interest in cooking and food. But at the same time, contrast that to the fact that many people lack the original skills to be able to produce and, and uh, create food products at the household level. So it's a really, really dy interesting dynamic for food processors. They want to have less manufacturing, more natural food products that people can prepare at home, but people at home don't have the skills to be able to make products. We're also seeing creep of uh, this technology intervention within the food manufacturing sector come all the way down to the consumer level. S so much conversation right now about the role of um, automated technology and um, technology coming all the way to checkouts and how, how is this going to impact? Well, all of this advanced manufacturing technology is great, except that there's only certain companies that have the capital to be able to invest in it. And so as I reflected on the request for this trends forecast, I had to reflect on the fact that Maybe there isn't one food manufacturing sector in Canada. Perhaps we obviously we have the segregation under the different um, under the different NAICS codes for different manufacturing sectors like bakery and tortilla, sugar and confectionery, meat processing, seafood processing, and so on. But I would like to counter that there's even within those sectors different sizes of companies and different speeds at which companies respond. And so in Canada, we have big food companies and small food companies. And we also have slow food companies and fast food companies. And when I say fast food, I don't mean McDonald's. I don't mean quick service restaurants. I mean companies that are very reflexive to the changes in technology and the changes in the workforce and changes in trends and others that are really defined by a legacy. And again, I don't want slow to be seen as a negative. I want it to be seen as how do companies respond to these changes? And many of the larger companies in particular have much more bureaucracy that they need to go through to be able to make changes. But at the same time too, there are small companies that are slow and there's a potential value in that. So let's overlay this with some examples that we can build out some case studies in. So big and slow, again, absolutely fantastic companies. So do not think of slow as a negative, but let's put our big multinationals in there, McCain and Maple Leaf. 
we'll, we'll, we'll parse out what I mean by big and slow and give some examples. Big and fast, we're seeing this with more venture capital groups like District Ventures and Green Space Brands being pulled into larger conglomerate form in a way that, unlike before, they're large companies, but with very minimal um, capital expenditure. They do not have a large amount of infrastructure that is, um, that is uh, part of their manufacturing sector. They're leveraging against the co-packing space. Fast and small, also very, very innovative in the co-packing space. In many cases, these are companies leveraging, um, leveraging expertise from the tech sector, where they're seeing the opportunity of being very lean, having very quick, minimally viable products uh, launched to market, and all produced using co-packing space. Lots of opportunity in here. And then slow and small is also really critical. And I have Shopify up there for a reason. It's not that Shopify is a slow or small company, but that small companies have the opportunity to act like big companies using online technology for vending. They do not have to build out the historical vendor relationships that you used to see to be able to get into, this, into, the, the, into the marketplace. But slow and small is is growing still. People are putting a lot of value in there. So let's parse some of this out. Big and slow. Let's take Maple Leaf. Maple Leaf is making some big investments here in Canada as well as throughout North America into additional manufacturing space and doing a lot of innovation in, in this area. Big and slow is very important to the success of our industry because they are the ones that have the capital to be able to put in investments into things like ma advanced manufacturing technologies. Big and slow are the companies that are doing these multi-million dollar builds and creating a lot of employment both within the sector as well as the spin-off jobs in construction and engineering and um, additional employment um, from the construction itself and the service industries that are um, supporting that construction and service industries allied to the functioning of those manufacturing spaces. Big and slow is where we're seeing the most investment in advanced automation. And what's great is they're the, they're the industry leaders in that advanced automation. They have the capital to be able to do that. But then we're seeing economies of scale on that advanced manufacturing trickle down to smaller companies. They're the ones who are pushing that innovation boundary on what is possible. And then we're seeing that move down into the smaller segments. How do big companies grow? Well, they're growing through mergers and acquisitions. And this is, a, this is actually American data, but if you take a look that we're seeing net total of mergers and acquisitions almost double in the past uh, 10 years. This is really, really critical. We need innovation. People, uh, household level consumers are very, very interested in looking for the next new product that's going to meet their needs and solve some of the many problems in this world. Large companies are doing it through mergers and acquisitions. They are finding those small and fast companies and buying them out. And oftentimes taking advantage of the um, really agile management strategies that the small and fast companies are able to contribute and leveraging in into their own organizations. I'm actually going to skip the cannabis. Everyone asks about cannabis. Every, everyone else is covering cannabis. I'm not going to talk about cannabis. This is a photo of my team down at CL. These are all students and researchers that are working with our Research and Innovation Center. Innovation still, still absolutely blazing hot. And we, as a society, are looking for that next new product. The big and slow companies are doing it through mergers and acquisitions. The big and fast companies are doing it through using venture capital models that are very, very um, agile. We've seen the Dragon's Den effect here in Canada, where a small scale entrepreneur is able to walk into a television studio, pitch their concept, and be able to walk out with 
thousands of dollars of investment. But this this is not just a television story. We are seeing other organizations in the venture capital space going about making strategic investments in food. Many people who have ridden on the cannabis bubble or ridden on the tech bubbles of investment understand that right now there's a big shift in how consumers are viewing capitalism and how consumers are viewing sustainability on this earth. And as long as there's people on this earth, we're going to be eating. And so there's a lot of innovation opportunity. Many savvy investors are seeing food as a core opportunity for investment. And that's where we're seeing some of these uh, venture capital groups, such as Darlene, or not Darlene, Arlene Dickinson's venture, uh, District Ventures, or Green Space, or um, a few different other organizations that are specifically strategically investing in food manufacturing as the core of their their economic growth. Green Space Brands, as I mentioned before, um, this is one of Canada's fastest growing companies, um, according to Canadian Business Magazine. And it is all through the acquisition of some of those small and fast companies, or in some cases, even small and slow companies. Take a look at the names of some of these organizations. We're seeing a, a lot of values-based companies in, up here. Organics, Responsibly Raised, Rolling Meadow is grass-fed um, grass dairy products. Um, food Made Better. Many of these companies that they are acquiring are reflecting on the uh, social values that are seen more commonly in this slow and small segment of the food industry. Those values are moving mainstream and the only way that it's going to become viable for them is to have the investment of venture capital to be able to take those ideas and launch them at a national level. Food waste. We can't not have a conversation about trends without food waste being part of that. And so I will put in my forecast that we're going to see even more investment with especially in the large companies, both the big and slow and the big and fast on showing social responsibility for environmental impact of food manufacturing. And that could be from more, um, more respectful investment in the packaging material, more mitigation of the food waste that's produced during manufacturing, and as well, some of those corporate social responsibility elements for the environmental impact done across the value chain. But food waste is not going to go away. We are looking very strategically at what are those opportunities to reduce it. Many reports put out by Value Chain International and Martin Gooch and his team have been focused on the role of food waste at the manufacturing level as compared to the household level. And manufacturing still has a lot of a lot of important decisions that they've got to be making to be able to regain the trust of consumers across the board. Again, can't say enough about plant-based proteins. This is not going to go away. The environmental impact of what we are eating is only going to become more and more um, critical. And we've seen reports such as the Eat Lancet report, Canada's new food guide, all saying, wait a second, we need to be focused on the environmental impacts of what we're eating and shifts to plant-based proteins. Again, let's use maple leaf as our case study. Maple leaf foods, bought light life uh, foods, bought field roast. They see the, the opportunities for business development as well as the opportunities to gain um, expertise by doing mergers and acquisitions specifically. Innovation has never been a more vibrant time in Canada. There are so many centers now. Back when I started my career back in, uh, back in the late 20 zeros, innovation was still something that was held by a very few players. And now there are all sorts of centers across the country at different levels, whether those are private sector centers, um, shared community collaboration, uh, opportunities, technology access centers, such as the one that I founded at Niagara College, the Canadian Food and Wine Institute Innovation Center, or its partners at Canada's Smartest Kitchen or 
the Food Innovation Center at uh, George Brown College. Our universities haven't gone away. If anything, they're getting more lean and understanding the role that um, really responsive innovation is going to take rather than just focusing solely on blue sky research, pushing the scientific boundaries. They're very becoming much more responsive to listening to the needs of industry and honing in on what is necessary for industry to succeed and meet the needs of consumers today. So it's it's such an exciting time to be in, in food manufacturing. I have not forgotten that final corner, slow and small. Huge resurgence in small industry as an opportunity for growth. And Canada is, is sitting on such a dynamic opportunity where we are creating food cultures that we're seeing dynamic communities being built around food. Markets are growing across the country as a whole. People are really investing heavily in seeing uh, the restaurant sector, the farmer's markets, the small business grow and succeed. And that is really exciting because as we were talking about some of those corporate social responsibility values that the large companies are having to embrace, it, in many cases, the small companies were doing this all along, making sure that they had responsible employment with fair wages, making sure that the environmental impact of food or food miles that were being contributed was as tight as possible, making sure that the employment opportunities were inclusive of the wide variety of diverse communities in Canada, First Nations, Inuit, Métis communities, finding opportunities to build these small businesses and build the communities around them that link to food, farming, fishing and forestry that surround the communities that this food is coming from. Small and slow though has a really unique opportunity and many of these small and slow companies are able to go straight from being small to being national launches and it's just it's just fascinating because they're taking advantage of e-commerce and internet technology to be able to completely circumvent the uh, classical retail spectrum once upon a time if you had a food product you'd either take it to um, you take it to a farmer's market or you might uh, hop in your car and drive a few cases out to the local stores. But with retail becoming such a centralized distribution model, small food companies in particular are taking advantage of internet sales platforms such as Shopify to be able to take their food product and distribute it nationally immediately. We talked about the Dragon's Den effect and uh, Holy Crap Cereal was a great example of this where a small company out on Seychelles Island in, um, in British Columbia was able to take their handcrafted food product using mail order distribution, get their food product into, into households as well as independent stores across the country in next to no, next to no time. Internet-based retailing is absolutely a critical way that small business is able to thrive in Canada. Again, we mentioned farmer's markets. Farmer's markets and the opportunity for food markets and food halls is absolutely a fun and phenomenal experience. Uh, Canada has so much richness. Again, we are a country that is based off of thousands of years of First Nations experience and such richness in our forests. And then we're bringing the best and brightest through immigration to this country, building out this opportunity for such a diversity of food means that we have so much to celebrate as a culture. I mentioned Shopify already, and so I'm gonna skip over that. I wanted to leave you with one story. This is a, a photo from uh, a friend, a client of mine, uh, and she runs a company called Victoria Panforte. It's a woman who came from, uh, she came from Russia. She had studied in Italy and fell in love with a food product. And she said, wouldn't it be cool if I could make this product? And she started, she built an online platform. She started distributing this product. She came by to visit me at my office. 
How many of this product are you selling? 25. 25 cases? No, 25. Like, cool. What can we do to grow? Took her out to make some introductions. Took a look at her internet platforms and she's now growing. She's growing and it's really inspiring to see companies grow, see people grow, see cultures grow in Canada. And each of these segments that we have in the industry has an important role to play to build up the workforce, build up the culture, build up the sustainability of our food systems here in Canada. And there's so much sharing of knowledge that is possible, whether it's the values that a slow and small company have influencing the big and slow companies, or the tech platforms that the fast companies have being adopted by the slow, the slow companies so that they can grow their industries and expand the reach of some of these unique products that, that Canada is able to create and get it distributed so that we can share those stories and share that culture. So my biggest take homes, big and slow, my trend forecast is we're going to see a lot of advanced manufacturing and artificial intelligence taking over. Big and fast, we're going to be seeing a lot of venture capital conglomerates and mergers and acquisitions occurring across the board. Fast and small, we're going to see a really dynamic startup culture with a lot of lean companies going really, really fast and furious to minimally viable products. And it's going to take advantage of the co-manufacturing environment that's really, that's really well developed here in Canada and has additional opportunities to be delving into new manufacturing technologies. And last but not least, that slow and small segment is where we are defining our culture, environment and values. And those small companies are able to make a stand about what values are really critical and those then trickle out to all of these other segments. I think we're in for a good ride in the next 10 years. So my last take home message, change is coming. Obviously stay relevant to the consumer. Productivity is going to be essential for every single one of these segments. So take advantage of identifying either out of the box technologies or identify opportunities within some of those innovation centers to find ways of increasing productivity to manage business success. Delicious, convenient, and right price is always going to be in style and keep on learning because learning is going to be continu continuous and is going to be essential for individual and organizational success. I'm still learning. I've got a lot more to learn myself. I love sharing ideas with you and I always love hearing your comments on my videos. So I look forward to hearing from you soon. Take care.